Uh, well, I want to follow up with some of what we're saying. Uh, as he mentioned, there's so many more Bible verses that we could point to, right? Proverbs 14, 34, that righteousness exalts a nation. Uh, Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous are in authority, people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. We can go a long way with Bible verses that are very clear on this. And even the reality of why we should get involved, that we have a responsibility, that God has called us to be faithful. And if you read some of the parables like in Matthew 25 or Luke 19, at the very end, he said, well done, good and faithful servants, right? Do you understand if you're faithful, it doesn't mean you're always successful, but it means you were consistent in doing what you were supposed to do, right? There's a reason that we have to make sure we stay engaged in the process and vote. And there's a whole bunch of slides I wanna show as we continue on tonight. I wanna start with our mindset because one of the challenges is right now for most people, our number one obsession is a national focus, right? We see what happens on the news and God forbid, right? That Joe Biden gives another speech where we're going to pay how many billion, million, quadrillion? I don't know if y'all saw that. Like it's wow. Obviously we need to pray for our leaders, pray for those in authority. And I'm also praying he's removed very quickly, right? Like this is crazy that this is our leader. And yet because of how bad things are on the national level, right? If you turn on the TV, what, what we are seeing, right? Kamala Harris is giving another speech. Joe Biden's giving another speech. We're, we're hearing things happening. And ultimately, as we look at what's happening in the nation, it's pretty ridiculous. Right now, Congress has the lowest ratings they've had basically in the history of Congress, right? Nobody is happy with what's going on, but also we, we could talk about what's happening in the US Supreme Court and we praise God for what happened to the Supreme Court this summer, right? Great things are happening. But for right now for the nation, this is an incredibly divided time in the nation. Look at the Supreme Court and what's gonna happen. And maybe we should expand the court so that right, liberals wanna have their way and the only way we can do that is we have more judges on there, et cetera. Well, if you look at what's happening, right, all of the news focuses on the national stories. And because of that, oftentimes it makes individuals feel paralyzed because we go, I, I can't change what's happening nationally, right? I can't change what Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer or Mitch McConnell, I, I can't impact what Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or even the Supreme Court does. And, and what I wanna encourage, right? The, the, the reason we're having this conversation tonight is why your vote matters. Well, your vote matters because you can make a difference. But when we only think about the national, it's easy to feel like we can't make a difference. I wanna point out, and, and, and my job is to go back and look at some history and I'm excited to do that. But as you go back to the American Revolution, as, as you watch the American Revolution unfold, right, the first four major battles of the American Revolution, as this is literally unfolding, as we look where we are today, we have a national focus. You know, in early America, when they had issues, there was no national call for help. In fact, there is no evidence that any one of those first four major battles, nobody called George Washington, the federal leader, right? Arguably, they didn't have time. Right? They said, we got problems, we gotta take care of this. But it's interesting, George Washington didn't show up. Right? They did not have a national leader solve national problems. They solved national problems at the local level because they got involved locally. And again, this is the reason we're talking about this is because people get paralyzed and feel like my vote doesn't matter. I understand why you feel like your vote might not matter, especially after 2020, we're not going there, but I understand, right? Why you might feel like your vote doesn't matter. But when we get involved locally, your voice becomes much bigger and more significant than most people realize. And if you get paralyzed looking at the big picture, you won't realize your piece of the puzzle that if everybody did their piece of the puzzle, we have now given this incredible big picture and solved the national problem. See, if you go back and look at the American Revolution, as it unfolds, the first major battle is the Battle of Lexington Green. What's interesting is there were 73 Americans against more than 700 British. I want you to think about this. It's single shot muskets. We were not a trained military going up against the number one military power in the world. You gotta know they had questions. Does my musket matter? <laughs> right? I mean, they gotta be thinking, can I really make a difference right now? Because they're outnumbered, right? The, the, the game is rigged, except they showed up. And not just they showed up, the 73 individuals who were there all came from the church with the Reverend Jonas Clark. Well, when the British leave Lexington Green, they go on to Concord. At Concord, there are actually Americans who've heard the British already opened fire on other Americans. And so at Concord Bridge, there are 300 Americans that repel the British at Concord Bridge. Well, who were those 300 Americans? They were all from the church of the Reverend William Emerson. It, it, it was a church that showed up. And, and again, let me point out, Reverend Emerson's church did not show up at Lexington Green. They showed up in their town. When they acted locally, 
Everybody said, let me just solve where I am right now. Let me get involved where I am. See, if you look on, on the, the battle on the road back to Boston, when, when the British realize, hey, we've now got opposition, words getting out, they're seeing other Americans show up, they go, we better get out of here before we get in trouble. They start marching miles on the way back to Boston. It's estimated there's between four and 5,000 Americans that show up along the way and they battle the British along the way back. Well, it's interesting, the people that show up, the, the historic records identify as people like the Reverend Payson Phillips, Reverend Benjamin Baltz, dozens of pastors who started leading their church to go defend other Americans and they're getting involved literally again on the local level. They're dealing with issues as they see them. When you go to the Battle of Bunker Hill, at the Battle of Bunker Hill, the Reverend Joseph Willard had two entire companies from his church that were there, but his church was there where the Battle of Bunker Hill was. What's interesting is if you look at the early stages of the revolution, the early stages of the revolution, nobody was looking for national help. Everybody said, we have a problem right here in front of us. We gotta solve this problem. But the reason I point this out is because if everybody would have looked at the national picture, well, how many British troops are there? There's more than 30,000 troops that were in America. We only have 100 men in our church. There's no way. Well, they didn't have to worry about 30,000. You got 700 in front of you. I'm gonna deal with the problem in front of me right now. And we actually won a national victory by focusing on the local level, okay? And, and, and the first thing I wanna encourage, right? As, as we're navigating this conversation, does my vote matter? Your vote is the most significant where you live, right? Your vote is the most significant for most people with names they have never heard. We don't know who's on the school board. We don't know who's on city council. We don't know local. We only know national, right? That's the problem because the local is where our voice can be the biggest and make the biggest difference. And it, it, first point I wanna make is local focus. But I wanna go a little further than this because it's not only local focus, I wanna talk about who got involved. Who, whose vote really mattered? Whose voice really mattered? Well, if you go back, as the revolution begins to unfold, right? When, when the British are coming, Paul River makes his famous midnight ride and it's on April 18, 1775. As he's making this famous midnight ride, he's riding very specifically to warn two individuals who were founding fathers because the British had put out word they're coming to seize the bodies of John Hancock and Sam Adams. And so Paul Revere is making a famous midnight ride to go warn these guys. The British are coming to get you. Now, he's also warning people along the way. We, it, was, it was reported the British were coming to seize the bodies of Hancock and Adams and the military supplies and storehouses from Lexington and Concord. So he's riding to Lexington and Concord, warning them, but he's warning Hancock and Adams. Well, where does he find Hancock and Adams? He rode to the home of the Reverend Jonas Clark, the pastor at Lexington Green, who was the cousin and mentor of John Hancock, but also friends of many of the founding fathers. He found those two guys there and he said, guys, you, you gotta get out of here. The British are coming for you. And, and this is also right before John Hancock is soon gonna be the president of Congress. At this point, John Hancock and Sam Adams are both leaders in the Sons of Liberty. Sam Adams has been writing part of the Committees of Correspondence. These are very involved guys in the revolution. So they're big deal names. And, and arguably, right, the king probably thought if we can silence these guys, we might can end this whole thing once and for all before it really unfolds. So Paul Revere says, you gotta get out of here. Well, Hancock and Adams, they talked to the Reverend Clark that night and they said, well, if the British really are coming, if they're coming to take all of our military supplies, which were all the guns, right? All of the gunpowder, the ammunition, which is also worth noting, right? This is the ultimate move of all communist dictator leaders, right? What are we gonna do first? Let's disarm the people. So. They understood if we are disarmed, we have no way of protecting ourselves, protecting our family, protecting our property, pr protecting our God-given rights. So we're not going to be disarmed. Well, they are talking to the Reverend Jonas Clark and they said, well, if the British show up and if this happens, do, do you think your men are actually gonna be willing to stand up against the British? And the Reverend Clark, it was reported, he got a little offended. And he said, of course they're gonna stand up. I've trained them for this very hour. Well, the next morning, the British showed up. And 73 Americans, they went out and they stood up against the British. In fact, the commander for those the, that morning was Captain John Parker. And, and John Parker, there's a very famous quote that comes from him where as he was gathering the men together, he said, stand your ground, don't fire unless fired upon, but they mean to have war, let it begin here, right? Now, it's also worth noting, John Parker was a deacon in Jonas Clark's church, okay? John Parker explained that he had heard Reverend Clark on many occasions explain the biblical positions of warfare and that God has given us the right of self-defense and self-preservation, but we can't go on offense. That's why he says, we're not gonna fire unless they fire at us, right? We're not gonna start this war, but if they want a war, we're not backing down. 
Now, this is real interesting, right? Because clearly this is what the Reverend, he, he says, this is what he learned from the Reverend Jonas Clark. Well, as the battle unfolds, the British do fire into the Americans. There's 18 Americans that are shot that I, I think it was 10 that died, eight that were wounded. And among those, you had John Robbins and Prince Esterbrook. John Robbins was a white guy. Prince Esterbrook was a black guy. So back then you had a multiracial church that was happening. They're all going to church together, which is also kind of interesting. But if you walk through the revolution, we've already identified a little bit, but on so many occasions, the battles that were happening and the people that showed up, they were the people from church. See, if, if you start tracking the revolution, even some of the leaders of the revolution, I, I love, for example, the Reverend James Caldwell. He was the commander, actually, back up. The commander of the forces of New Jersey was a deacon in his church. So he was the pastor of the commander of the forces of New Jersey, but he was considered one of the leaders, one of the commanders, now not the, the highest ranking officer, but he was one of the commanders of the forces of New Jersey, but he chose to not be the top. He said, no, 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 I know my role is really as pastor, and so I'm gonna just follow your lead, but I'm gonna go and I'm gonna be with you. Well, he was with them along the way, and he actually made a name for himself against the British. There's many battles we could point to, but one is the Battle of Springfield. At the Battle of Springfield, the Americans, as everybody were at that time, they're using muskets. Well, muskets, for anybody familiar with any kind of old-fashioned weapon, you have to, obviously, pour your powder in and then your ball, and you have your wadding and your ramrod you use, and the, and the wadding helps pack it down. And so as they're going through this process of the battle, they run out of wadding. Well, without wadding, you can't keep the powder and ball compact at the back where hopefully your flint is going to give it a spark and you're going to right, have this eventually shot go off. Well, they knew they were in trouble. So the reverend said, guys, follow me. And Jonas Clark, oh, excuse me, not Jonas Clark, uh, James Caldwell, he said, follow me. He leads them to church. He runs inside the church and he comes out with a stack full of hymn books. The hymn books were Isaac Watts hymn books. Isaac Watts was the famous hymn writer of the day. But what's great about this is he ran out and he held up one of the hymn books and the quote that the men said they heard him say was he held it up and said, give them Watts, boys. Let's put Watts into them. Okay. The British actually had him assassinated. They put a target out, not just on him, on many pastors, because they identified the pastors were the ones that were firing people up, that were giving people the courage to go forward. And so they needed to stop these pastors. And that's actually part of the origins of what we know as the Black Robe Regiment. They called them the Black Regiment, but they referred to the black clerical robes that the pastors wore at that time. And they said, we've got to stop these guys because of what they're doing. They targeted pastors. Well, there was a reason that actually makes sense they were targeting pastors because pastors really were that involved in early America. One of my favorite examples is you can go to a guy like the Reverend John P. Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. His father is the founder of the Lutheran Church in America. They came from Germany. Uh, he had a brother. He and Frederick Gussis, they were both ministers. But what's interesting about him is in January 1776, right? At this point, you've already had the shot heard around the world. You had the Battle of Concord Bridge. You've already had the Battle of Bunker Hill. This already unfolded. And there, at this point, he is a member of the state assembly. And where they are, they are in their state capital at Williamsburg. And he is there as a elected official for the state. And he's a pastor at the same time, okay? So he's a member of their state legislative body. He's pastor. Well, while they're meeting, the British came marching into Williamsburg. And just like they tried to do election in Concord, they decided they were gonna take all the military supplies. So they actually went door to door. And they begin taking all of the guns, all of the gunpowder, disarming the people and arguably taking whatever else they wanted. Well, Patrick Henry was the governor at that time because they had already kicked out the British appointed governor. Patrick Henry was the new guy. He's the new governor. And Patrick Henry found out what was going on. He sent word out, said, you go rally every man, every able-bodied person, you tell them to come back here. Well, they got about 5,000 people is what the reports are. And as they're coming, most of them are disarmed, but they came with their axes and their pitchforks and whatever else they had. And at the time, the British detachment was 200 soldiers and they had just left town. Patrick Henry said, we're chasing them down. We're getting our stuff back. So literally they sent a delegate, like 5,000 men, they're going out and they surrounded the British. Now the British have all the guns, but there's 200 of them and they're single shots, right? So they saw this massive crowd and the Americans gave them the option. They said, you're not going to steal from us. So either you can return all of our weapons to us or you can offer to buy them from us. We're not letting you take them. And the officer realized the danger. He said, I'm so sorry. We did not mean any trouble. Take all of your stuff back. Well, they bring all the stuff back to town, but Patrick Henry reconvenes the state assembly and says, this is now an act of war. 
And, and, and before this, they weren't in Virginia. Now they're in Virginia. And he said, they've just declared an act of war and we need to get back word wherever you can, start rallying Virginians. We're, we're now joining into this thing. So the Reverend John Peter Gabriel Nuremberg, he was commissioned by Patrick Henry to go back to his home church in Woodstock, Virginia, and to rally a regiment of troops to come and join. So he actually got on his horse. He rode back. It's about a nearly 200 miles of the crow flies. It's about 220 miles. Estimates are the trail he'd have to take, but he made it back in time for Sunday service. And for anybody familiar with horseback riding, that is a long ride on horseback. He made it back in time for Sunday service. And at Sunday service, he actually opened up his Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter three. It says there's a time, a season, a purpose for everything under heaven. He starts at the beginning, a time to be born, a time to die. He gets to verse eight, which says there's a time for war and there's a time for peace. He closed his Bible. He told the congregation what had just happened in Williamsburg. He said, this is no longer a time for peace. This is now a time for war. He then closed in prayer. And I always try to imagine like, what would it have been like in that moment? Right, like that's, that's gotta be awkward, right? If Pastor Mark gets up and he's like, all right guys, just so you know, we're taking four cars to tomorrow. Everybody get ready. Like, <laughs> you are crazy, right? Like this is literally, John Peter Muhlenberg is like, we're going to war guys, let's pray. I can only imagine in the room, you're like, what are we, I mean, we're praying, but this is weird. At the end of the prayer, back then they did not have microphones, they had elevated pulpits. At the end of the prayer, he then began to disrobe in front of the entire congregation he revealed that he was wearing the uniform of a Continental Army officer. And after he disrobed, he then came down the stairs from the elevated pulpit and they had one aisle down the middle of the church. The church, by the way, is still around today. Pretty cool, you can go see it. But he walks down the middle of the church and as he's walking down, he tells them, brethren, we came to this land, to this new world, to practice our freedoms, to, to enjoy all that God has given us. If we don't get involved and fight for it now, we might lose everything we came to this land to enjoy. He says, I'm going to fight to protect our freedoms. Who wants to go with me? Well, they actually had 300 men join him and they became known as the 8th Virginia Regiment after those 300 men joined him. Now, what's also worth noting, his brother was a pastor in New York City. His brother was Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg and his brother found out what John Peter had done. And there's a series of letters between them kind of interesting, but Frederick writes him and says, you have totally blown it. He says, if you wanted to be a soldier, fine, but don't pretend like you can be a pastor and a soldier. God doesn't call people the two vocations like that. He said, if you're gonna be a pastor, you need to focus on pastoral things. Don't try to be a soldier and a pastor at the same time. And John Peter writes him back and he says, brother, he says, I understand what you're saying. He says, but if it wasn't for people like me getting involved to fight to protect and preserve freedom, you wouldn't even have any freedom left to begin with, and his brother says, no, you're crazy. The only reason y'all are having problems in Virginia is because you've got those hotheads like Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson. He said, in New York, we are much more level-headed, so we don't have a problem with the British, okay? Well, clearly that is incorrect, but what's worth noting is as the course of the revolution goes on, John Peter Muhlenberg, not only was he there gathering a regiment, he became a major general in the American Revolution. And if you look at, at some of the most famous moments from the American Revolution, like the, the famous winter at Valley Forge, his men actually were part of the ones who built barracks there at Valley Forge, which they now have some barracks up that you can go and look and kind of see what it looked like from Valley Forge. But, but his men were there all the way through the revolution. His men were part of everything. In fact, the last major battle of the revolution, the Battle of Yorktown, he's literally one of the guys in the painting. He was there at the last major battle of Yorktown. If you even go to Washington, D.C. today, they have in Washington, D.C., uh, like in Statuary Hall, where you see statues all around. Well, throughout the Capitol, there's over 100 statues in the U.S. Capitol. And one of the statues in the U.S. Capitol is to one of the most famous and influential Americans, the Reverend John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. Well, this is a pastor who got involved in the process, making a huge difference, but I'll go even further. What's also super interesting about this is if you go where Congress meets outside of Congress, right before you go in is the speaker's lobby. The speaker's lobby, they have the paintings of every single individual who's ever been a speaker of the house. They have the first one and the second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh. And so everybody who's ever been a speaker is right there. Well, they have a picture of the very first ever speaker of the house. The very first ever speaker of the house was Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, the brother of John Peter. The reason was the guy from New York well, when he told his brother, the only reason you have problems in Virginia is because you're hotheads like Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry. Well, the reality was the British just hadn't made it to New York yet. 
1777, they marched into New York City. And at that time, the British were already blaming pastors. So the common practice was they would destroy churches wherever town they would go to. New York City had 19 churches. They burned 10 to the ground. They destroyed the other nine, having troops go and break out all the windows, break in the furniture. He literally watched while they destroyed his church. And at that moment, he had an epiphany, <laughs> right? He said, oh, I guess my vote does matter. Let me get involved, right? So he got involved in an actually becomes a member of the state legislature of his state and then became the speaker of the house of his state and then was a member of the first Congress and was chosen to be the first speaker of the house. And even if you go back to when Congress, uh, uh, once we have George Washington, right? Constitution was done in 1787. It's ratified uh, arguably 1789 when George Washington becomes in, right? We've now had the fulfillment of the constitution. We now have a president, we have the first Congress. The first Congress is tasked with coming up with a bill of rights. Well, if you look at the Bill of Rights, again, a significant moment, in the Bill of Rights, there's only two signatures on the Bill of Rights. John Adams, who was the vice president, and the Speaker of the House, Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg. But what's cool is not just that Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg's name is on there. If you look at the first Congress, the guys who came up with the Bill of Rights, the members of the first Congress, many of them were pastors who had been involved in the revolution. And when it came time for government, they were chosen to be the leaders of the nation what I want to point out is not only we had a local focus in early America, there was actually a church focus. And had it not been for the influence of the church in early America, the revolution would not have been won either, right? It was a church on the local level. And let me give you one more thought, three thoughts, local level, church involvement. But here's a third one. One of the things I think is very cool reading some of the old writings and letters. There's a cool letter from John Adams. He's writing Abigail about some of the miracles they're seeing happen in the revolution. And he tells her, it's amazing. He says, we, we, we just captured a, a 64 gun British man of worship and a 20 gun British man of worship. It's amazing. Now, why is it amazing? Because before we were separating from Great Britain, we were British colonists. So, so we didn't have our own military. We didn't have our own Navy. So when the revolution unfolds, we did have some trade ships. And what we would do is we would start taking whatever cannons we could find and we'd put them on whatever ships we had. If you go to Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian Museum of American History up on the third floor, they have one of the very first ships from the American Navy. It's called the Gunboat Philadelphia. The Gunboat Philadelphia looks a little bit like a rowboat with cannons on it. Right now, now understand, John Adams wrote Abigail and said, it's amazing. We just captured a 64 gun British man of worship and a 20 gun. Brit Those are ships with 64 cannons and 20 cannons. How did we capture them? with rowboats, right? Like this, <laughs> arguably they were a little bigger than rowboats, but I'm making the point, right? Like we didn't have a Navy. We, we didn't have these fighting ships. And what's interesting is John Adams later than writes her letters is I was in a tavern and I was listening to people talk about the incredible things we are seeing along the way. And he said, one of the men said something that I think explains it the very best of what we are seeing. This man, and this is what he writes his wife, Abigail. He says, this is what the man said. He said, it appears to me, oops, there it comes. It appears to me the eternal son of God is operating powerfully against the British nation. John Adams says, I think that summarizes it the best. Okay. Now what's worth noting is if you track the revolution, there is no doubt God showed up all over the place, except here's what's interesting. You know, some of the most prominent moments where God showed up were not in victories. Well, that's interesting. If you go to the Battle of Long Island, the Battle of Long Island happened in August, 1776, shortly after the declaration. And, and this is actually a map from one of the British officers, a military historian. And he identified there were 30,000 British, there were 9,000 Americans, and they had the Americans pinned. And, and, and Washington is leading this military. This is arguably like the majority, if not all of the American military, and they are pinned against the river. And the British, for whatever reason, after they pinned them the first day, they decided to take a pause, Time out. And they rested for like a day and a half. And then, which doesn't make any sense, by the way, right? You have your enemy trapped, like go ahead and finish this off, win this war. But they just paused. And then they decide, hey, let's go ahead and, let's, let's go ahead and send the Navy up behind them so we can bottle them up. We'll have the Navy sail up the river. And that way they're totally trapped. They can't go anywhere. Well, that night, as word gets to the British Navy to sail up, a massive storm breaks out. And the storm is so big, the Navy can't sail up to block in the Americans, but George Washington realizes they're trying to block him in, says, okay, we have to get off this island. 
So he sends word that his men are gonna go find anything that floats, right? Canoe, rowboat, John boat, big pieces of wood, anything that floats, we're getting off the island. Because also back then, most people didn't know how to swim, right? So it, it, it's about a mile to the other side, but they didn't know how to swim. So we need something that floats. We're gonna get across this. Well, they begin gathering whatever boats they can. And that night, interestingly enough, the storm that had kept the British from flowing up, the storm subsides, and a wind now comes from behind them and begins blowing in their favor to get them across the other side. Well, let's go even further. As they're doing this, that night, they're not able to get all their troops off. The next morning, estimates are there's about a thousand men left. It's starting to become maybe a little gray and they, oh man, sun's coming soon. Washington was not gonna leave until every one of his men was off the island. So he's gonna be the very last guy, but he's not gonna be off in time. Well, before there's any light the next morning, a heavy fog descends and rests over the whole area where the troops are. In fact, Major Benjamin Talmadge, who was the head of the Culper Spy Ring, one of the very famous spy rings in American history, he, explained, he was there and he explained it this way. He said, a very dense fog, well, maybe coming, a very dense, it is there, I promise. A very dense fog began to rise and it seemed to settle in a peculiar manner over both encampments. I recollect this peculiar providential occurrence perfectly well. And so very dense was the atmosphere that I could scarcely discern a man at six yards distance. Okay, so his own records, he's like six yards, we couldn't see anybody. Well, the reason again this matters is because the British hold their charge because they don't even know what's happening. Well, George Washington gets in the last boat. When the last boat makes it to the other side, the fog lifts. Okay, now here's again what's significant. The Americans knew they're outnumbered, they're outgunned, it's hopeless. And they lost almost every battle they were a part of. Now they were able to hold ground at times. They won very few battles in the revolution. And the revolution arguably, depending on how we define battles or skirmishes, there's more than 200 battles in the revolution. We won like 40. That, that's not a good winning percentage right? Like that's not making the playoffs for your team, okay? They lost almost everything they were a part of, but even in their losses, they saw God show up in providential ways to protect them, preserve them, and keep them engaged in the fight. If you go, the, the end of 1776, right? The end of that year, this is where you have Washington now navigating, what are we gonna do? Because at this point, really, they've only had defeats since that moment. All they've had is defeats. Every encounter, they've lost. It, it, whether you look at the Battle of Long Island or the Battle of Kipps Bay, you can go to the Battle of White Plains or the Battle of Fort Washington, the Battle of Fort Lee, and ultimately the entire loss of New York. So all they've done is lost, and if all you've done is lost, and you have one year enlistments and those enlistments are up at the end of this month, you can imagine how people were feeling in that moment, right? That obviously, at this moment, morale, uh, that's not my slide. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> the computer might have died. It just went black over here. I don't really know. I don't actually need it to finish the story. So morale is incredibly low. And he decides that he needs to have a victory in order for them to be able to get enlistments back. So as he's trying to figure out what they can do, well, they're coming up on Christmas. And the Americans largely didn't celebrate Christmas the way that we certainly do today. But Washington knew that there's a Hessian outpost at Trenton and the Hessians, Germans, not only do they love Christmas, they love alcohol with their Christmas. And he said, if we go to the Hessian post, like wait, Go Christmas night, let them get plastered drunk. The next morning we show up, we could probably win that battle, right? Let's, let's go for this. 5,400 men, the, the idea was they were gonna go 5,400 men. We're gonna try to cross the Delaware that night, but what they didn't count on was all of the massive ice that was floating down. And, and so they thought they could relatively quickly get their men across. Well, not only could they not get all the men across, they only got about 2,400 men across. It took them hours longer than expected. And so what they had estimated was we'll get across and, and by, by midnight we're across and then we're able to be set up the next morning by like 5 a.m. And so we'll be set up before it's light. And then when it's light, we're able to, to let them know they're surrounded. We can get them to surrender. It's gonna be great. Well, now they realize that it's 4 a.m. by the time they got across. There's no way they're marching and making it to the fort before it lights up. What in the world they're gonna do? Well, we're, we still have to have a victory. Washington says, let's go. So they start marching. As they start marching, a blizzard unfolds, like massive blizzard. Blizzard, so, it, and if you remember early America, they were not prepared for winter, right? Like 
they didn't have the winter clothing, the coats, the warm boots, whatever else. Two men actually froze to death in the march. Now, you gotta ask yourself, right? You're George Washington, you're like, God, I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to go to the right place and you're sending a blizzard. Well, this would be very frustrating. But what Washington did not know, what none of the Americans knew, is that when the blizzard came down, the Hessian guards who were watching over the fort, they said, a blizzard? <laughs> Nobody's crazy enough to be out marching in a blizzard. Let's go inside. All of their guards came inside to stay warm by the fire. So Washington and his men show up late. It doesn't matter because all the men are inside. They surround them. 8 a.m. is when they open up. In 45 minutes, they've won the battle. They have killed, wounded, and captured all of the Hessian military. Only three Americans were wounded. What is significant as we continue on, George Washington, 1778, he wrote to General Thomas Nelson, and he said the hand of providence has been so obvious, so conspicuous in all this, that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith and more the wicked that has not gratitude enough to acknowledge his obligations. When Washington wrote that, they had lost almost everything. And yet, he said, we still see God moving. This is really important for where we are. Because so often, right, we feel like, well, I'll vote if we can win. You understand how long it took the Americans to win the revolution and how many battles they lost before they won? Victory comes from a persistent perseverance and a deep determination, right? The Americans did not win. The Americans did not win because they had truth or because they had moral and right on their side. Not even just because they had God on their side. Because even though God was showing up, if they had stopped the fight, they'd have lost. But the reality is as a Christian, the time that we lose is when we quit. Right? Let's hypothetically say we vote and it doesn't go the way we want. So many people get discouraged and want to quit. God has not given Christians the option of quitting. God has called us to be faithful regardless of the outcome. But understand faithfulness, where you make the biggest difference is on the local level. If we will, as a church, get involved on the local level, this is literally the battle and game plan we saw unfold the revolution. And then with persistent perseverance and deep determination, we won the American Revolution. Your vote matters, even if it doesn't always feel like it, even if it maybe is gonna take a couple years before us to see the victory, our vote matters and we have to stay faithful, persistent, and determined in what we're doing. Thank you guys for letting me share.